Forget fingerprints and foot tracks in the snow. Police who really want to nail a suspect can go a lot farther these days with a crime-fighting tool that should be foolproof. They can take blood, semen, or even a single hair from a crime scene and determine its molecular structure, the DNA that is different for everyone but identical twins. As a means of identifying criminals or letting the innocent off the hook, it is the new way to solve violent crimes. But it has its problems. Should suspects be required to give blood samples the way they now give fingerprints? Whatever the answer, the genetic sleuths are already at work. Christmas Eve, 1987, at 10 Macy Street in Scarborough, Ontario. It would be the last one for Robert Wilson. His ribs were all smashed, uh, his spleen was ruptured. One of the forensic pathologists indicated that they felt it looked like a small bomb had gone off inside it. It was the grisliest murder the prosecutor Robert Nuttall ever saw. It was pretty clear that that deceased person had been tortured, he'd been cut, uh, parts of his body had been taken off, uh, his elbow had been dislocated. Uh, it was pretty gruesome. Police tracked down a taxi driver who remembered dropping off three men at 10 Macy Street. The victim, Wilson, 34-year-old Richard Bourgeois, and 20-year-old Frank Maccaro. Police followed the two for three weeks. On January 20th, 1988, they were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. There was a strong case against the pair who'd been partying with Wilson the night he was murdered. A cab driver saw them all together. There were blood stains on their clothes, and there were wiretapped phone calls. Then Bourgeois broke down. He confessed when police confronted him with photographs of the mutilated body. This was all pretty compelling evidence, but still not enough for a prosecutor who wanted to make Canadian legal history. It certainly had all of the components to be a good test case. And there were some good forensic reasons as well to proceed with it. The suspects tried to torch the dead man's apartment to destroy the forensic evidence. There were no usable fingerprints. But police found blood all over the place. There was also blood on the suspect's clothes. The Crown intended to prove it came from the murder victim by using genetic evidence, something never tested in a Canadian court. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. This is a computer drawing of what it looks like. DNA is found in cells throughout the body the blueprint that gives everyone their unique characteristics. Only identical twins have the same DNA. Forensic scientists can take DNA from any blood, semen, skin found at a crime scene, even hair roots. In the Wilson murder case, the DNA would come from blood, one more piece of evidence in an apparently airtight case. Once you have the guy bourgeois telling you I'm the one that did it, doesn't that put a capper on it? No, it doesn't. Um, because there's always the specter of the false confessor. Um, one never knows uh, that uh, when an individual who obviously has become unhinged in terms of dealing with the horror, is he really talking about himself or is he fantasizing about it? Uh, the defense of the self-confessor is not a new one. The Crown asked for blood samples from Bourgeois to compare to blood found on both suspects' clothes. He refused on the advice of his lawyer, Michel First. I'm there to protect my client's rights and to see that the authorities do so as well. And uh, in my opinion, given that there is no law compelling him to provide a blood sample, there was no point in him doing so. In Canadian law, only suspected drunk drivers are forced to give blood samples, but getting bourgeois' blood turned out to be unnecessary. Scientists intended to match DNA prints taken from the blood of the dead man to DNA prints taken from the blood stains on the suspect's clothes. Police also recovered a cigarette butt used to torture Wilson, but the lab couldn't get enough saliva to do the DNA test. The DNA print taken from Bourgeois' vest was a perfect match to the murder victim. The chance it belonged to someone else, one in 675 million. First knew then, it was all over for her client. I met with my client and explained to him that the result was such that it, it really meant that it would be impossible to argue in front of a jury that the blood on his vest was not that of the deceased. And once that sunk in, then he started to, to look very seriously at what possibilities were open to him. One, obviously, was that he would be convicted of murder, either first or second degree. The other was that he would be found guilty of manslaughter. But at that point, not guilty 
it was clear was no longer a verdict that was a possibility. There was no need for a trial. Bourgeois pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He's serving life. Macaro was also sent to jail for life. Give me your right hand. Relax. In the world of cops and crooks, fingerprints have been standard tools in crime fighting since the turn of the century. But they're not as helpful in catching the bad guy as Hollywood movies would lead you to believe. It's true that no two people have the same fingerprints and that the technology to find them has gone high tech with laser beams. But in real crime scenes, they're rare and fingerprints only prove the suspect was there. There are also computer generated drawings, but they are only as good as the eyewitness's skill in describing someone. A couple of weekends ago, we went back for a family reunion. Technicians do have ways to measure and compare voice patterns, but voice prints on their own are not accepted as a means of identification in Canadian courts. They're just not accurate enough. In Edmonton, DNA evidence became the key in the case of the spandex rapist. For two years, Detective Vern Frost tried to catch the man who stalked and raped seven women, one woman twice. Frost identified the royal blue pair of spandex tights as the rapist's trademark. The police put James Parent, oil rig worker and convicted child molester, under surveillance. When they caught him breaking into a house occupied by two women and a small child, Frost thought he had the spandex rapist. With the evidence we found during the period of time we were watching him, we felt we had a, a fairly strong circumstantial case. I mean, I've spoken to a lot of investigating officers, and besides the incredible legwork you do, there's a lot of gut feeling. What was your gut telling you? I, I, it had to tell me that I believed he was the person responsible. I have to have a reasonable belief that it's him before I charge him. Parent cut his hair and went to court, accused of eight sexual assaults and break and enter. The Crown's strategy, to weave together the evidence from the eight attacks to prove that one man did them all. There was circumstantial evidence, but little else. The Crown hoped that the DNA evidence would prove to be the smoking gun needed to convict Parent. They hired a genetic expert, Dr. David Hoare in Calgary, to get DNA prints from the seminal fluid stains in the underwear of three of the victims. When I looked at the circumstantial evidence, I was of the opinion the individual was guilty. That was the way I started on that case. Hoare needed a sample of parent's blood to compare to the DNA he found under the microscope. Parent refused. By coincidence, the RCMP had Parent's blood on file. They kept a sample from an earlier investigation in which Parent had been a murder suspect. Parent's lawyer, Sterling Sanderman, fought to keep the new evidence out. My strategy had to be to try and keep the blood sample that they'd received from uh, James Parent out of the trial as a piece of evidence because I didn't know what the testing was going to, to reveal. Midway through the five-week trial, the Crown's expert witness on DNA got the results and dropped the bombshell. We examined everything careful and there was irrefutable evidence that he was not involved in two cases. And then we spent late night one night to actually gain evidence in a third case and prove that he was not involved in that. And in fact, the interesting thing to me was our evidence suggested two different rapists were involved. So that would say to me that two rapists were loose in Edmonton that were not um, the accused. The Crown had no choice but to introduce the DNA evidence and destroy its own case. The trial was over. The arguments about DNA were never heard. Parent was acquitted of all charges except the break and enter. Detective Vern Frost. How did you feel when the DNA evidence exonerated your guy? Well, how did I feel when it exonerated? I'm sure it was a letdown to us because we felt we had built a, a good case. I felt. What does a good that case. say about your gut instincts? You start questioning it. Yes, I'm still questioning it. Uh, I may not ever resolve it. I'm, you know. You don't, I, I, what I hear is you don't want to believe that the DNA fingerprinting told the truth. No, I, I, I don't think it's exactly that. If I, if it told the truth, I've got to accept it. Okay, and I know it will work in the future, so I'm in a conflict. I also know what my gut instinct says. 
the case of the spandex rapist in Edmonton has never been solved. While Canadian courts have yet to hear arguments for and against DNA evidence, last year the trial of Tommy Lee Andrews in Orlando, Florida set a precedent in the United States. This was the first time anywhere that somebody was convicted solely on his genetic prints. It's a Tommy Lee Andrews, accused of rape. Cut her, raped her, robbed her. And that for that, he should be convicted, and I ask you to do that. The court ordered Andrews to give blood for DNA testing. His fingerprints on the victim's windowsill were not enough to charge him, let alone convict him. The DNA evidence did both. The court commits the defendant to the Department of Corrections for the maximum term allowed by law, 22 years. Since this landmark case, DNA evidence has been used in at least 200 cases in the United States. Counsel, have anything further in connection with this case? That being so, this court will be in recess until 8.30 Monday morning. Defense lawyer Michelle First hopes that Canadian courts don't follow the American lead in ordering blood on demand. I think there are some very real civil liberties or right to privacy concerns inherent in that. I appreciate that people say, well, now persons charged with certain categories of criminal offenses can be required to provide fingerprints. And in fact, failure to do so is also a criminal offense. On the other hand, requiring someone to provide a blood sample is a much more intrusive type of thing. And my personal opinion is that it might well be contrary to the Charter of Rights to enact that sort of mandatory legislation. Canadian police forces have their hands tied in getting DNA evidence because there is nothing on the books that gives them the authority to take blood or hair. The best they can do is convince suspects to volunteer samples. I think the courts are going to have to resolve that and they will resolve something. They'll either say we can't take them or we can take them and there's going to be charges against policemen who will probably be charged with assault when they take standards. These cases are going to be coming up within the next two years. You'll so if see. you take a hair sample you can you could see that you could possibly be charged with assault? If, if I pulled the hair out of your body without your consent there's the possibility that exists. Uh, the courts are going to have to make a decision whether or not that's legal to do that. Without legislation, it puts a police officer in a very difficult situation. The prosecutor in the Wilson murder case, Robert Nuttall. How far are we prepared as a society to allow a police department or a police officer to go in a particularly gruesome or horrible case? in extracting from an accused person without any form of legislative permission that bodily substance. It doesn't take too much imagination to think that there are ways that one can get blood from someone that are just totally unacceptable. The courts will be forced to confront this new technology soon. Across this country there are 24 people who could be found guilty of a crime solely on a blood test.